Behind the Attic Wall by Sylvia Cassidy, Chapter 1 The man waiting at the station when she first stepped off the train was the tallest person she had ever seen. His round black hat moved like a planet above the crowd, and the silver knob of his walking stick hovered just below it like a moon as he made his way toward her on the platform. He looked her full in the face. "'I'm looking for Margaret Ann Turner,' he said. "'I don't suppose you would have any information on where I might find her?' "'No, yes.' How are you supposed to answer a question like that? That's me, but he was already swinging her canvas duffel bag over his shoulder, and she realized that he had known who she was all along. She wondered what description he had been given. Brown beret, brown coat, brown socks, ugly face, bony legs, untied shoes, sandpaper knees, rotten temper. He was examining her very carefully now. You're quite certain that you are Margaret Ann Turner, he asked, and not someone else with the same name. Another unanswerable question. It's Maggie, she said. Maggie, he exclaimed. Perfect. Perfect for me is what he means. Drab girl, drab name. I love the name Maggie, he went on, as she glanced up at him suspiciously. Nobody loved the name Maggie, but his face was serious. It makes your teeth feel good to say it. Maggie, Maggie, Maggie. It feels like eating peanuts. Try it. And he paused, waiting for her to recite her name aloud. She turned away, but she did try anyway, to herself, and she felt a surprising tingle around her upper molars. Maybe like eating peanuts, maybe not, but she couldn't really remember what peanuts tasted like. "'I'm your Uncle Morris,' he said. "'There is nothing remarkable about the name Morris at all, although I am told there is a chair by that name and also a dance. I can't imagine why anyone looking around for a name to give his fam to give his chair would finally settle on Morris, can you?' Maggie said nothing and stood still, her eyes on the ground, while he continued to scrutinize her. North Wellington Academy for Girls, he read on the emblem of her beret. Is that really a girls' school you have on your head? he asked. If it is, its architecture seems strange. For one thing, there are no windows. She would make it clear to him that she didn't enjoy being teased. It's a hat, she said icily. She removed it from her head and rolling it into a tube, slid it into her coat pocket. Ah, said Uncle Morris. Imagine having a girl's school in a hat. Maggie made no reply and followed him as he made his way across the station platform to the lot where his car was parked. He laid her duffel bag carefully on the back seat and held the door open for her. As soon as the car began to move, she started to pick out letters of the alphabet from storefronts and billboards, getting quickly from A to I, but it was a while before she found a J, and soon the town was behind them and the signs grew sparser and sparser, and she gave up before reaching K. "'Now, Maggie,' said Uncle Morris suddenly, "'you must tell me something about yourself.' People were always saying that. "'Tell me about yourself.' There was nothing to tell. She had been eight, she had been in eight, no, nine places to live, and had been thrown out of all of them, usually for poor adjustment, which meant kicking people or stealing. Now she was going to stay with some aunts, great aunts, actually, whose name she didn't even know, and who lived in a place she had never heard of. Uncle Morris turned his face to her, waiting for her answer. I'm twelve, she finally said. Twelve, he exclaimed. How very nice, he returned his eyes to the road. Would that be inches or dollars? She glanced up at him. What? Twelve inches or twelve dollars? Years, she answered. Twelve years! As old as that, he paused for a moment. How do you keep your hair from going gray? And he turned to her again, expecting a reply, but this time she didn't answer. What else? he asked. She looked out the window. What else what? What else is there to tell about yourself? What do you wonder about? Do you ever wonder, for example, if everything that looks green to you is really everybody else's red? Maggie turned from the window and looked at him. She had wondered that once. What if the grass and the trees and the woolen skirt of last year's school uniform, all the things that were called green, really looked red or blue to everybody else? It was a scary idea. Crazy, really, and it surprised her to hear someone else, an adult, give voice to it. Have you ever wondered that? he asked again. No, she answered, and she moved her knees aside when his hand came down on the knob of the gear shift rising from the floor. They were in the open country now. Maggie narrowed her eyes until they were nearly shut making the road ahead jump back and forth and shimmer like a fish. "'Do you keep a diary?' Uncle Morris asked suddenly. She turned to look at him. "'How did he know about that?' 
She had kept a diary once, when she was at Mrs. Malloy's four years ago. Five, a black leather diary, except it wasn't real leather and it wasn't a real diary, and it wasn't hers, it was an appointment book, and she had taken it from the headmistress's desk. Many of the pages had already been filled out, but there were some that remained empty, and she used these to write on. Each page was divided into hours, from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., and you were supposed to write down things that you had to do that day, but she used it for writing things after they had happened, not before. 7 a.m., got up, brushed teeth, got dressed. 8 a.m., ate breakfast. 9 a.m., threw up. One day, though, she had drawn a line through all the hours written and written only one message, Build a wall of flowers. She had built a wall, a wall of flowers, or had tried to that day. She had pulled all the flowers from the beds surrounding the school building, every single flower from every single bed, and arranged them like a row of bricks, yellows on reds, reds on yellows, and when she was all finished, she would stand behind it, behind the wall of flowers, and let no one in. But she had run out of flowers when they were just a few inches off the ground, and Mrs. Malloy herself had caught her. That was her last day at school, and her diary ended on that page. Do you keep a diary? Uncle Morris asked again. No. Why is that? She shrugged. There's nothing to write. But I only wondered if you kept one, not if you wrote in it. I throw all of mine away. Maggie decided not to answer his questions any more. They made no sense, and everything she said was wrong. Instead, she concentrated on the scenery, taking a strand of her hair as she did so and sucking it to a sharp point. The open countryside was giving way now to a small town. The roads leading off to the right and left had street signs, not just route numbers. And now and then there was a, there was a row of stones. Maggie found her K on a no-parking sign. Soon they were passing houses, large ones with wide lawns, and small ones, too, with their numbers written out in script over the doorways. 183, 185... In the distance was a fuzzy roofline of a large gray building, a school maybe, or a factory. We'll be there pretty soon, Uncle Morris said. And Maggie suddenly wondered about the house she was being taken to and the people who lived there. Once, long ago, she had lived with a mother and father, a real mother and father, not the foster kind, in a plain brown house with a wooden porch in front and a miracle of a garden out back. Since that time, every house in her imagination took on an arrangement of that earlier, of that earlier one, with its narrow hall doorways, living room on the right, dining room on the left, kitchen in the rear, and its three bedrooms all in a row upstairs. It was the house in which she placed the three bears and Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother and Joe, Meg, Amy, and Beth. It was the house in which she placed all her old schoolmates when they left her behind on the boarding school lawn and drove out the gates with their mothers and fathers for weekend visits. It was the house in which she placed herself when she was told that she would be looked after by two great aunts who had agreed when no one else had to take her in and let her live with them she'd taken up the she'd be taken up the front porch steps of this new house with the living room on the right and the dining room on the left and her two great aunts would be waiting for her great aunt had a kind of fairy tale ring to it and she thought of two great women in great billowing dresses with great with great white aprons and smiling great white smiles when she stood before them on the wooden porch, they would kiss her and say, What a lovely face! And then they would tell her about how happy they were to have her with them because they always wanted a girl of their own, just like her, and they would take her into the kitchen and give her cocoa and cookies. The car was now winding up a long hill. Dense trees grew on either side, and Maggie could see no houses at all. Nothing, in fact, except the fuzzy outline of a building whose rooftop had appeared earlier in the sky, the factory or whatever it was. In the next moment it came into full view, a massive stone structure with rows, and, with rows of narrow windows and a heavy double door at the head of, a, of wide stone steps. A prison, probably, Maggie thought, squinting at it and sucking on another strand of hair. Well, there it is, Uncle Morris announced. Maggie sat up. There what is? That's where you're going to live. There? She was going to live in that building? But that was an institution, a prison. What of the house with the front porch? What of the two great aunts? A rich liquid sprang from the sides of her mouth. I have to throw up, she said, and Uncle Morris drew the car to the side of the road. He leaned across her to open the door and gazed out the windshield while she bent over the roadside. Here, he said, when she had closed the door and he had started up the hill again. And he handed her a white handkerchief from his breast pocket. She
she wiped her mouth and nose, and then didn't know what to do with the crumpled cloth in her hand. Give it back to him, sour as it was, and let him return it to his pocket. Hold it on to herself, and let its smell rub into her moist palms. What? Finally, looking straight ahead, she raised it slowly to the edge of the window and released it, turning at last to see it flutter like an injured seagull in the dust at the side of the road. Neither of them spoke until they stopped on a circular driveway before the large building, so large its shadows cast a chill on the car and blackened the surrounding trees. Well, Uncle Morris said, here we are. And that's the end of chapter one.